Good afternoon, and welcome to the special session on technology transfer. My name is Arthur Henderson, and I'm uh, the track chair for uh, this particular session. I'd like to welcome all of you here, and I'd like to introduce our speaker on technology transfer. We have Harry Waters, representing NASA's Technology Utilization Technology Transfer Office. Mr. Waters is a NASA Marshall Space Flight Center retiree. He has over 30 years of civil service contributions to NASA programs, activities in Huntsville. He too is known for founding the future. Mr. Waters initiated or helped establish the payload crew training complex at Marshall Space Flight Center. This payload crew training complex uh, is used by astronauts who come to Huntsville for extensive hands-on and comprehensive training. Um, among the other things, uh, Mr. Waters has uh, had the opportunity to work during the Von Braun uh, directorship at Marshall Space Flight Center, and many of us uh, would love to have that opportunity, especially myself being a Marshall Space Flight Center employee here in the 90s. Um, so the list goes on uh, in regards to the many things that Mr. Waters has uh, contributed over the years, and it's my pleasure to introduce Harry Waters. I would like to talk to you tonight, this afternoon, about something called technology transfer. Technology transfer goes by a number of names. I'm sure you've heard of NASA spin-offs, uh, technology utilization. The idea is that our business is spaceflight, but what we do can make a difference beyond spaceflight. We can make a difference to U.S. industry, we can make a difference to the populace in the United States. I want to tell you what it is, uh, why we do it, a little bit how we do it, some of the results, and if you're interested how you can tap in to technology transfer, take advantage of some of the research that's going on at Marshall Space Flight Center and NASA in general. What it is, of course, is, is very simple. <clears throat> it's a process of moving the technology from NASA, from federal laboratories in general, into the private sector. Uh, at Marshall, it means uh, moving everything we know from the labs, making it available to whoever wants it, whoever can use it. We do it to comply with objectives and to make the fruits of NASA research directly available and to enhance the competitiveness of uh, U.S. industry in general. We, we are now have been under an obligation to try to do this, to, to make our research and findings relevant to, uh, to the population at large. There are a number of reasons to do that that date all the way back to the beginning of the Space Agency. Part of our original charter was to try to become relevant to, to the population in general, and not just to space flight, but to anybody else who can use the kind of research spin-offs that we have. At all NASA centers, we do this in two ways. There are two fundamental ways that spin-off is accomplished. One of them is called technology push. That is, by advertising the technology we have in such instruments as Tech Brief magazines, we depend on the private sector to recognize the value of that technology, to come and grab it, license that technology, and then spin it off and exploit it in some way. The other way is technology pull, and until recently that has not been done very effectively within NASA. At Marshall, we've pioneered some ways to enhance the pull, and the pull is, let's allow industry to identify the problems and issues that they have, and then let's take a look at the NASA inventory of technology and see if there's any way we can have a match. There's a big difference. If we go to an industry and say, do you have a problem with, with with your production process or with your products that you would like to see technology applied to? The answer may be yes, and we may have a technology. They may have not recognized that there is something within NASA that could help. So now we have a, and I hate the word, but a much more proactive way of seeking out technology transfer. And if you'll excuse this busy chart, <coughs> this sort of sums up the way technology transfer happens at Marshall Space Flight Center. There's a traditional way through the Tech Reef magazines and 
Cosmics and Spinoffs, which you probably are aware of, probably familiar with these magazines. These bubble up from the laboratories and from our contractors. In each issue of Tech Brief magazine, there is a compilation of boiled down technical briefs that, that summarize the latest work that NASA is doing in a particular field. Those are widely available. They're free subscriptions. As a matter of fact, uh, I have a handout I encourage you to take. A part of this handout is a subscription form to Tech Brief magazine. It's one of the best deals that there is from NASA. It's a free compilation. Uh, it comes out almost once a month with, uh, with all the latest technology that NASA has. Broken down into different dis disciplines like materials, uh, uh, electronics, uh, data processing, and so forth. It's obvious. That's the technology push. We still do that. In addition to that, in Marshall, we've, we've got some agreements with surrounding southeastern states. And those agreements basically state that we in the state will cooperate in making technology available and, and making the people in those states aware of what can be gained by interacting with Marshall. We have uh, a representative assigned to each one of those states. And what happens in those states is we help organize sweeps or canvases of industry in, in particular locales. We will visit the industry, we will, we will seek problems, we will make them available of the kind, uh, aware of the kind of technology that we have available, and then encourage them to give us the kinds of questions that, that, are, that are on their minds in industry. In this, in this publication here, we also have the kind of form that allows industry or individuals to, to uh, simply state a problem and mail it to us. And we will circulate that problem. When we get these problems in Marshall, we have a technical assistance, technology assistance board that convenes about once a week. And we review each of these problems. We first of all ask ourselves, is it appropriate? That is, is this, are they asking a question that they could easily answer by talking to a consultant? That, that's available technology, there's nothing unique about this. If that's true, we don't want to compete with somebody who's, who's in the business already. But if there is a technical or a technology solution that we have a unique answer to, then we take that problem and we delegate it either to our Marshall Science and Engineering Director, where we know that there may be some expertise, or one of our contractors, our major contractors, another NASA center or other federal laboratories. <coughs> we are affiliated, as most federal laboratories, with something called the FLC, the Federal Laboratory Consortium, which is a consortium uh, designed to spread technology abroad. So that's an available reason. When we have an answer, we get it back to the, the originator. And uh, in most cases, uh, we, we provide some very positive input back to them. This has evolved into a quite an extensive network, uh, not only in Alabama, but all across the South. We have uh, relationships with the Regional Technology Transfer Center, which are another part of the NASA Technology Transfer Network. As I mentioned, the FLC and the National Technology Transfer Center. So it's a growing network, and we have growing uh, use of the network. You can see the, this has only been going since 1989. The number of problem statements that we have coming to us is growing every year. Last year, we, we had 340 almost. This year I believe we're already at that and the year has only begun. So we can see this growing by leaps and bounds. What kind of problems do we get? I mean, they're not all huge things. I mean, they're not all earth-shaking problems. Uh, we had a small business here in Alabama came to us. They had built a composite duct for an aircraft. Uh, in order to sell this to a large air, airframe manufacturer, they had to show that this duct could withstand a horrendous number of takeoffs and landings. It was an air conditioning duct, was all it was. Not even a critical part. But until they could show that this thing could go through um, the equivalent of 200 years of flight service or something like that, they could not get this test commercial. They went to testing outfits and nobody, could, nobody would do it. They, commercial testing outfits wouldn't step up to it. But we at Marshall uh, were able to do that. 
This is the kind of testing we do frequently, routinely. Uh, we were able to do that. Uh, they paid, this industry paid, for the expendables that we used in the test, which amounted to two or three thousand dollars. And we did the testing. They have their results, they're selling their ducks. It's a success story. We went up in Tennessee to Jack Daniels, <clears throat> one of the people in our, in our territory. Jack Daniels was having very much difficulty with clean room and instrumentation. They had to keep the dust down and they had to instrument some of their processes very precisely. They don't have the expertise in clean room technology that we do at Marshall. So we were able to work with Jack Daniels Distillery and, and uh, help them improve their process considerably. One of our scientists here at Marshall worked on the X-ray telescope, which, uh, which has flown a number of times on uh, small rockets and, and also on shuttle. Uh, he has adapted that same technology, which is normal incidence X-ray technology, not the concentric mirrors, but normal incidence. Uh, highly precise, precisely ground normal incidence mirrors with multiple coatings, one or two uh, molecule thick coatings, which amounts to a bandpass filter. Now if you do that in a microscope, you can get to the point where you can distinguish between carbon and water in an individual cell, which until now you can't do. The, 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 the bandwidth is too broad. You can't resolve between the nucleus and the protoplasm of the cell. This uh, promises to be um, one of the bigger breakthroughs in microscopy. Uh, this was undertaken as a result of a request that came to us from, a, from the National Cancer Society, which asked, do you have any technology that could help with the diagnosis, treatment, or cure of cancer? And it's, it turns out that this, this astronomical telescope, normal incidence x-ray telescope and optics, are directly out. This lets us image an individual cell for the first time. So there's a spin-off that, that, that promises some, some real bonuses. At Marshall, of course, our major business is propulsion and structures. Uh, and therefore, the kinds of problems that we have, the kinds of inquiries we get when we work, tend to go along those lines, as you can see. About a quarter are uh, materials related issues, composites, foams, uh, characterizing uh, uh, different kinds of structures that are, that are used. Uh, process engineering uh, is, a, is, is a, we have a large facility at Marshall, you may see it if you tour Marshall, which is the Productivity Enhancement Laboratory. In that, uh, it's a pilot laboratory where we pilot, uh, run, run pilot studies of various kinds of manufacturing techniques, uh, new kinds of welding, uh, new kinds of layups, new kinds of composites. From that, uh, we have a large quantity of technology that's available to the private sector. We just finished a uh, technology spinoff with Great Dane Trailers in Tennessee. Uh, as a result of the cooperation with this, they built a, a brand new flatbed truck that completely composites the structure and everything with the wheels. But the, the flatbed structure itself is a honeycomb, uh, uh, multi-directional honeycomb structure with composite structure below. That's not how they break down. This is our broadening chart. Since we started doing all this outreach stuff, we've reached about 57,000 folks and we've worked about a thousand technical problems. The, the point is that this is a this is a capability that's available to you and to anybody who wants to make use of it. Here's a few few examples of uh, this was a fellow who was uh, an individual, in fact. He uh, happens to be a retiree, but he had an unfortunate accident with his own shop, workshop, cut his arm off, cut his hand off. And he found that the prosthetic devices that were available to him did not allow him to pursue the lifestyle he wanted. He wanted particular prosthetics to, to aid, uh, to, that, that would allow him to take advantage of the rotational motion that he still had in his arm. Turns out that the commercial products that he could find were not suitable. He couldn't find any commercial product that, that capitalized on this motion that he had, and the ones that he did find were 
prohibitively expensive. We were approached by a by a greenhouse in Georgia. They said, can you help us with the greenhouse process? Now this is a very labor-intensive process, cutting geraniums. I would never have believed that robotics had anything to do with geraniums. But sure enough, in Georgia, robots are now selecting the geraniums to be potted. They're weighing the little geranium shoots. They're putting them all in those little blister packs that you see when you go to the Kmart, you know, all these large blister packs with little shoots in them. And you think that somebody had to do that, every one of those, and make sure that they were acceptable for sale and the way to write them out, put them in there and inventory. It's a tremendously labor-intensive operation. It is all being done now by the head of the robot with vision, of course, and other sensors to, to tell the, the mass of the plant, the configuration of the plant. That, that one really did surprise me. I didn't think there would be a possibility for that. We have people come to us with more humanitarian concerns. Uh, recently, we got a problem statement that came to us from uh, Osteopathic Association, I believe it was. Uh, it turns out that wheelchairs that, that we buy, that you've seen, uh, are, are tightly coupled to the seat. The wheel and the seat and the axle are tightly coupled. So when a person rolls over a gravel driveway or something, it's, it's a jarring experience. Now, it turns out that's not so bad for most folks. But if, but if a person is old and frail and uh, has uh, some sort of osteopathic problem, it can be very painful and maybe even harmful. So the question was, is there a way to put, to, to, uh, put a shock absorber on a wheelchair? Sounds straightforward. Why not put a spring between the axle and the seat? Well, the problem is, if you've got a spring between the axle and the seat and you try to push yourself along, you end up bouncing up and down. The energy goes in the wrong place, so it's not a good solution. So these young fellows are, are very good at composite materials, intelligent materials, and what they've done was design a wheel, uh, which itself is the absorption mechanism. It's sort of like rolling a balloon over a rock. The axis of the balloon doesn't move, but the balloon distorts. And so this wheel will distort, and you can still push yourself along and then have the energy efficiency that you need. It turned out to be an interesting, uh, challenging problem. Uh, in the process of doing that, this young fellow from uh, North Alabama uh, was over here to sort of advise us on wheelchairs in general. It turns out he is... Uh, wheelchair marathon champion and he wanted to know with all our lightweight materials and high strength materials could we do could we make him a wheelchair well we did and uh, it's a this is a wheelchair that we hope will allow him to carry off the world championship it's a massive wheelchair you see he's already raced it's been quite well matter of fact there he is number of others of these and I won't. So how are we doing? Well, we're doing not bad. We, of all those problems that we sent back to the people who asked us questions, we went back to them later and said, did we help? And about 80% said yes, we did. And about 80% were extremely satisfied, or very satisfied to help. They got 20% said no, you know, we want to try to improve that. Technology transfer is a is a rocky road. It's a difficult thing to get transfer from a federal laboratory out into private industry. It's not easy. It takes an awful lot of, of persistence, and it's a contact sport. Usually, you've got to talk to the person who can use it. You've got to put the person who developed the technology in contact with the person who might be able to exploit the technology and help it along every bit of the line, every bit of the way, which is what our office tries to do. But when it works, everybody benefits. The taxpayer benefits because he gets a double return on his investment. He not only has his investment in space exploration. The industry, of course, benefits. And this is something that, especially lately, this gets a lot of a lot of talk. Uh, there's a lot of push to to get the technology from the federal sector into the private sector, particularly with the uh, uh, the, the uh, 
the military revamping and with, with the emphasis that we're seeing lately in this administration. We benefit because uh, we, we see the work we're doing, our, our folks benefit. Everybody that works in technology transfer seems to get an extra kick out of what they've done. That's what we do. That's what technology transfer is. This book explains how you can take advantage of it. We have summarized here all the various avenues of technology transfer. There's a catalog that gives that where, where all of the NASA software developed is it resides. That's available. It's publicly available. Here's how you do how cooperative undertakings can be un, can be uh, can be done. Projects like we've talked about. Uh, Technical assistance, the, the forms, if you've got a problem, a question, any kind of, it's in here how to, how to address that. And how to license NASA technology. It's all explained here, so I won't go into that. So I encourage you to take this. Um, this little book here is nothing more than a summary of what I've just said, so you're welcome to take that too. Are there any questions? I'd be glad to. Yes. Has there been any consideration of repricing Cosmic Software because Cosmic Software was, seems to have been priced originally for mainframes and it was, it was dirt cheap for mainframes, but as an author I read in a computer magazine put it, Cosmic Software is now sold at a price that uh, Microsoft would find pleasantly exorbitant. I agree with you. I agree with you. It's, uh, it needs to be rethought. That's, uh, but I believe it is, it is being reconsidered. Yes? You have a terrific consortium of states. Yes. That multiplied by the individuals who have been helped. Uh, does this information get to your congressman and to your representatives? As a matter of fact, forth? yes, it does. Um, and that's another, only lately. Only lately, but, but it does get that way. We're able to sort it by con congressional district, by the number of organizations or, or companies in those districts, the number of problems that we've worked in those districts, and in some cases, the, the dollar value of that interaction. So yeah, we're, it, it's, started, it's, it's filtering back. It's I not as- all of those potential letters from people that you right. helped in the 70 or whatever, 80% multiplied by the number of states and so forth. Must be a terrific mail. Get a bag of mail in the senator's office and tell us what a great thing's going on. These guys don't even know what the hell's going on. We need to we need to work that more more thoroughly than we have though. We've done it on an on an individual point basis, and it's, we, I guess we've done it with oh, eight or ten congressional. Yeah, we seem to be kind of talking to each other, talking to the guys we can help, and everybody's saying that's great, and it's fine. We need to get those guys writing to the Congress. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. That's, that's very good. Certainly. Yes. You said you have representatives in six states. Yes. Would it, it, would it be worth expanding that to all 50 states? Well, of course, we we at Marshall Space Flight Center are located in the southeast. There are other space flight centers across the nation, and there are the regional technology transfer uh, centers as well, like in, in Florida there's the stack, which is the Southeastern Technology something and something. And it's a transfer center as well. Uh, the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center has an agreement with, I believe, Virginia and also West Virginia. We're both in West Virginia and a couple other states. It's difficult for us, given our, our budget and our manpower level, to do much more. I think we're about to add Arkansas for obvious reasons. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's it's not But we had a request from South Dakota and we we just can't do that. That's too far, it's too much travel, we can't really service that. You know. The people we have assigned to those states are not resident in the states. They're here at Marshall, but their their job is to is to stay in touch with, with all of us economic development folks and technology uh, outreach people in those states. Every state has a has some sort of entity that that's concerned with caring and feeding business. And there's there's the small business, you know, the SBDC. There's uh, an ECD in every state, an economic uh, 
community development organization of some sort. They're all different, but they all got some characteristics in common. And our people who are assigned to the states, their job is to be in touch with that group, to help that group develop an outreach program, and then help make it happen with meetings like this, with chambers of commerce. Chambers of commerce have turned out to be a very, very effective way for us to, to reach into communities. It's an interesting story about Chambers of Commerce. So if someone from Oregon called you up, would you, would you be able to help them? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if an individual were to submit a problem statement like, on, like the one in this book here, certainly it would be work like any other. It just means that we don't have a, a concerted effort in Oregon to, to go into Oregon and help the Chambers of Commerce organize sweeps through the community. We do in Tennessee, for example. We'll help the Chamber of Commerce in, in, uh, in Lynchburg, Tennessee, organize a sweep through that whole county where the Chamber of Commerce forms a committee and goes from business to business and says, what, is there any way that you can think of that this kind of technology can help you? That works much better than if we go over there and we say, we're from the government and we're here to help you. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> you have two if, questions over there. But if their buddies come, they're, they're very willing to come. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the years past, as I've been involved in this for a number of years, uh, the question in terms of at what point does technology transfer become copyrightable, which means to say that I've seen all the booklets and various other things compiled by people who are just straight off the board NASA stuff that I got from NASA and they've got a copyright on it. How do they do that? And then so, so, and they sell it for money, you know. What's the where does the where, what's the line on what you can do with NASA's material to sell it and copyright it? Like for instance you buy slides that you and I both know where NASA slides that somebody puts together and it sets and sets up sets for 25 cents, mm -hmm. sells for 25 cents, and it says on there, copyright. Now, what's the rule? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, think I can talk to you about licensing technology. Now, that's once that's done, once it's done, it comes to yes, license. And then maybe, you know, what made me think about this was with your question about this uh, computer program. Evidently, somebody's taking the same program and put their name on it, and they're selling it for folks. Uh, well, no, no. Cosmic is, a, is, a, is an instrument of NASA. Actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a NASA entity that, that is, is well, it's, it's actually run by Georgia. I do that in my business. Can I speak to it? Yeah, sure. Um, the copyright laws allow you to take a compilation, to put together a compilation of NASA materials, and then your copyright covers these six NASA publications put together in this order. The individual NASA documents are public domain and anybody could take them and put them and use them in any way, shape, or form. The only thing that's copyrighted is uh, my, cover, my cover sheet is copyrighted and then those six publications in exactly that order. So the copyright is essentially useless except that there are a lot of people that see copyright and it just scares them off. They don't know intellectual property law and they don't understand the stuff from NASA. So it's kind of, it's Kind of like a kind of like a bluff, kind of like an oct an octopus uh, blowing blowing ink. So there you go. You get a slider, and that's how you can publish it. There is another another aspect of that to uh, add some value to what you get from from that. For instance, there's three or four software companies that took some software out of Cosmic and enhanced it, and are selling it to a variety of customers. Yes. You mentioned the Federal uh, Laboratory Consortium. Does yes. that include other laboratories than NASA? Yes. It's, How it's does, a, what does that do? It does. It's a consortium of all federal laboratories across the country. I don't know how many hundreds there are. But it's Department of Energy. It's uh, Department of uh, Interior has, has some laboratories involved. It's, uh, of course, NASA, Navy, Army, all those, all those services. They all belong to this consortium. The purpose of the consortium is to promote the dual use of technology that's been developed at taxpayer expense. The way they do it is to maintain a computer bulletin board. Uh, they don't have a very active outreach. They, they haven't been able to afford an, an, an outreach effort in this consortium. Because there's no government money or no other money to, to run this consortium. It's just a, 
It's just laboratories getting together and agree to pass these problems amongst one another when they, when they have one, which we do, which we do. When we get a technology issue that we don't have any expertise at at Marshall, uh, we'll look at other sources like other NASA laboratories, other NASA centers, and this Federal Laboratory Consortium. In other words, we'll put it on the computer bullet board. Sometimes we get a hit, sometimes we don't. Kind of like a fishing expedition when we do that. I see within a company where information like this will come in, it'll be given to the president, pick it up for some office who collects it to the research department <coughs> or the product development department. They look it over and say, oh my goodness, only because they didn't think of it themselves. That just doesn't burn me up some fears <coughs> because they didn't have the idea. They're giving the impression to their management that they're not doing their job. And here's some other guy out here has sent this great thing in. And, uh, well, you know, there's, there's a whole area called inreach into the federal bureaucracy. Uh, as I mentioned to you, there's, there's, there's a great push now for all federal research and technology laboratories to try to get the technology that's been developed at taxpayer expense out there in the world big push from the top side. One of the problems has been that it's hard to translate that top side push down to the individual scientist and engineer. He's got his job to do, he's got, a, he's got something he's intensely interested in. Whether or not somebody who's building you know, automobiles can use that same technology really doesn't concern them. It hasn't. At Marshall, one of the things we've done, which is fairly unique in everybody's job description, Every engineer and scientist in their job description, it, it mentions technology transfer. It's, it says that you will be rewarded, in effect, if you can identify technology that you're doing that can be reused in the private sector. Since that happened, um, at first there was a lot of concern about this. Oh, what's this new thing in my, in my new responsibility? Well, you know, it, it turns out that doesn't hurt somebody. I mean, there's no way that can be used against somebody. But if you do something, if you do transfer, if you do find some way to transfer technology, it's 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 a big bonus for you. I mean, it's a very big plus in your, in your rating at the end of the year. So we found that at Marshall, at least, the response we get to questions when we go down and ask somebody, do you know, can you help this person with this problem? Our response is tremendously better. We get we get nice reports come back and say, here's the literature, here's what's been done lately, and here's what we're doing. So we're able to answer things much more completely than we have before. Any other questions? I do encourage you to take these documents, so until they run out. <laughs>